I mean, where I came from in the defense industry, I'm not real proud of at times. I mean, I was the guy that would work, Colin, I don't know if you remember this or not, but I'd work 17, 18 hours a day in the wrong damn direction because I thought if I just work real hard, there's no quit in me, I'll be successful. No, you'll be tired. <laughs> and you'll be a hard worker. Put me against the best of them, I promise you. Put me in a room of hard work, let's go. Hard work does not equal results. I'm telling you. It, it is not a one for one. You need hard work for results, don't get me wrong, but you can hard work in the wrong direction just as easy. Has that not happened to, ha to you guys before? Have you not busted your ass? I'm like, well, that didn't turn out like I thought it was gonna turn out. But I worked hard. Yeah, that, it, we gotta be smart about it, right? So this whole week, I want you guys to be thinking about challenging what I'm saying. Not just me, what Matt says, and Todd says, and, and Tony says, and S Super Sam over there says, I always call you Super Sam, I don't know why. Super Sam says, right? Cannon and Chris are gonna share ideas. Colin's gonna be sharing things up here. You really need to listen to what they're saying and don't, like, <coughs> there's a difference between just hearing it and feeling it, okay? And some people are better at speaking, they can deliver that message better, but I challenge you to really listen to what they're trying to say and feel it and take a nugget away, pay attention. If you guys do that this five day, four days, your wheelbarrow will be full of freaking nuggets. When you get back, you won't even know what to do with them. You'll be looking through them, trying to, I know where to start. There's so much valuable content here, but it's not going to give, be given to you in a handout. Notice that. I'm not going to give you a handout that you can take home and read. When you don't have time, you'll never read it. It won't happen. So I challenge you to stay focused, stay in, in, engaged here in the time and the now. Uh, we're all here. We shut down our lives, travel across the country to be here. So invest into it, okay? Part of the journey, 100%, perspective. You get out of it what you put into it, okay? Here we go. I'm gonna talk about one of the number one, uh, how would I quantify this? The most important step you need to take in your business today, right now, and my belief, to move from owner-operator to entrepreneur spirit, company. So before I go into that number one step, let me tell you what I'm talking about. Owner operator, you guys get a drink if you want, just move around. Owner operator is the guy working his tail off in his business that is digging holes, that is selling jobs, talking to customer, ordering material, everything. Owner operator, he's badass, he's a fence ninja. Like if we gotta build a really cool fence, we're calling that guy. All right, he owns his job. Doesn't know it, but he owns his job. He works a ton of hours. Uh, that's an owner, operator. Talented, great guy. We need him in the industry. Then you have the entrepreneur list, or the serial entrepreneur, okay? This guy pulls levers and pushes buttons, motivates, uses his mouth to move a machine that builds fence, all right? Lots of fence, great fence, but maybe not uh, the most craftsman, ninja, super fence guy, okay? But he can move a mountain of fence, all right? So those are the two different pieces. Think about that right now, put yourself in a bucket. Which bucket are you living in right now? Are you an owner operator? Or are you an entrepreneur? Business. I can probably look around the room and tell you, we've got a good mix. We've got a good mix of guys that are owner operators, and we got some guys that are entrepreneur, and we got guys that want to move from owner operator to entrepreneur, right? Am I right? Is there guys here that want to move from one to the other? Owner operator? My body does. <laughs> I'm bold. You're, you're still flirting with it. You're a hybrid. We've got to get you out of the damn track hoe. So, but get her done. Fence Unlimited. I'm in the middle, you know, I'm you're, transitioning. You're, you're flirting with it. Yeah, I'm flirting with it. And you're flirting with it too. You're, you gotta get out of it, right? So where are you guys at in that journey? Owner, owner, operator. owner operator. And do you wanna get out of that? Yes, do you wanna get out of that? It's okay to be there. I'm not telling you not to be there, but you gotta make a decision of where I wanna go with my business before we can even start to help you. You guys are in the middle of that. All right, I would say, 
you're definitely not owner operator and you're working hard to become an entrepreneur type business, right? Spencer, where are you guys at? So you're, you're moving. So in this group, is it fair to say, I know where you guys are, is it fair to say I don't have anybody in the group that's owner operator that wants to live in owner operator world? Is there anybody here that says, Sean, I want to continue being an owner operator? Okay. And that's fine, but that's a different mindset than what we're going to be coaching on, okay? So I <laughs> want to make sure we get, figure that out. Entrepreneurial business. The number one tip I can tell you is I'm going to explain it to you by giving you a, an analogy so you have, to, you have to play along with me. The number one thing, write this down, is to get the hell out of the driver's seat. Get out of the driver's seat. We're going to, you're going to play, we're going to visualize this for a second. All right? Cannon, what's the What's, what's the car you want the most? If you had all the money in the world, what would you, what would you buy? Oh, man. Uh, Come on. Car, truck, train, yeah. plane. Uh, what would you want? <laughs> Submarine. A truck, like a, like a GMC Denali. Ooh. <laughs> this guy's driving a GMC Denali. Look at that. You got a red. Yes. You got a GMC Denali out there. All right. Here we go. What color is it? Uh, blue. I would have said blue, too. Who said blue? All right. So there's a black GMC Denali outside. This is great. This is going to work great for you. All right. Listen. Here we are. Black GMC Denali. Cannon. I just told him, get out of the driver's seat. That's a nice GMC Denali, is it not? I'm telling you, get out of the driver's seat. That's your business. Okay? So the business is the truck. <laughs> there's no autopilot. You can't go autopilot. Too late. See, that's the thing about making decisions in business. <laughs> Nugget, we don't get to just pull them back real quick. We got to go with it. Yeah. All right? We don't get to say, start over, do over, I want to do it again. All right? You cannot, you'll, you'll, you'll die in business if you're afraid to make a decision. One, so make it and be okay with it. Yeah. Two, okay? So be okay with you're not going to make the best decision. You, now you know you wish you would have had Tesla, but there's no Tesla. You are now driving a black GMC Denali. All right, black GMC Denali, not a Tesla. All right, so we're talking about the number one tip on how to get your business from owner operator to entrepreneurial spirit is to get out of the driver's seat. However, what are we driving? We're driving a black GMC Denali. That's his favorite vehicle. That's what he wishes he had. All right, so the black GMC Denali is your company. It's your baby. That's what you always wanted. Boom. And I'm telling you, get out of the driver's seat. All right, so that means somebody's got to drive your black GMC Denali. Step one. How do you feel about that? Not good, I know. Right. <laughs> right, so you gotta get the right person in that position, right? All right, so you're out of the driver's seat. Okay, now guess what? That GMC Denali comes with a remote control. It's the coolest thing. It's a remote control. Looks like that iPad you got in your hand right there. GMC Denali, black, with a remote control. You're out of the driver's seat, but you got this control. All these buttons on this control, you got a screen on the control, like, yeah! You can be at home in bed. Wherever you, where, where would you want a vacation? Oh, uh, Come on now, we got, we got a piss break coming up. Somewhere like uh, Aruba All right, so he's in Aruba. He's got his remote control. GMC Denali's driving down the road in Jackson, Tennessee. <sighs> he's like, I got this. I'm gonna drive my company because I'm not in a driver's seat no more. Sean says I should do it from here in Aruba. And he can see the screen. And he's like, all right, cool. Budget plan, schedule done, material ordered. Okay, here's what we're gonna do. This year we're gonna do 3.2 million, we're gonna do 90% commercial, whatever. Boom. And you tell the car, hey, we're gonna go right. That's what you did. Like, you know the map you're seeing up here, Google map, you see that the tracks that you've laid out for your business says you gotta turn right. Because you did a planning. You're gonna get out of the business, you have to plan your business. This is, it becomes a game. You have to plan everything. You got to plan all your expenses, everything's already planned out. Who's going to work, how many trucks. We'll do that activity over here later. You say go right. This is where the shit hits the fan. All right, this is where most guys get stuck. Everything up to this point sounds easy. Get out of your business, run it like remote control. Okay, cool. You say go right. You said Mike's driving your car? Okay. So you tell Mike turn right. <laughs> no, this is what happens. Almost always in your business. Visualize this. He says, 
we're gonna do this. And the team member says, you want me to do what? Turn right. What? Turn right. When? Oh my God, you're gonna miss a turn. Turn right right now. This one? Oh my God. And they missed the turn. Mikey missed the turn. So now all you're planning is like, now you're in emergency mode. Because that was your plan. You were gonna take I-95 and go over here. You're basically gonna do this. You're gonna get this much workflow in. Life was gonna be good, but you missed the turn. So now you're like rerouting, rerouting, rerouting. What do we do? Do we U-turn? Do we continue on, take the next turn? So you're in crisis mode. You're not in the car. And you have to figure out how do we adapt to this screw up? Whose fault was it? I'm gonna disagree. Right? Step one is to understand that that's a hundred percent Cannon's fault. I know you don't like to hear that, but I love you anyways, bro. That's a hundred percent Cannon's fault. Not Mike's fault. Why is it not Mike's fault? You didn't put my GPS on. <laughs> it's not a Tesla. Why is it not Mike's fault? It's not his company. True, true. So anybody in your business is not going to run that business like you would as a business owner. That's not gonna happen. So let's get that thought out of our mind. It's never gonna happen. There's no unicorns that come into your company and run it like you would, all right? Never gonna happen. Okay. It's your fault because you didn't plan for that communication gap, all right? You plan too soon because, and this is a little bit tricky part, you were trying to protect yourself. And what does Sean mean by that? We're all gonna do it. I promise you, when you go back and do this. <laughs> now, that's not, hands off is no good either. But we're trying to protect ourselves. So let me explain to you this way. Owner operators are great firefighters. Well, most business owners are great firefighters, all right? We're damn good at putting out fires. Like, that's our job. We come to work, we smash putting out fires. We're really good at it. You know what firefighters primarily do? Fire suppression systems, fire extinguishers, fire safety, does not have a fire, right? They, they rarely fight fires, they've got to figure it figured out. But us, owner, operator, entrepreneurs that are in there involved in their business, we're, we're firefighter, we're, we smash everything. So your whole day is spent, high steel, <laughs> smashing fires, right? Okay, so go back to the protecting yourself part. The car, he told him to turn right at that first turn. That was step one. And he missed it because of the communication gap. But Cannon told him to turn right right there, or, or let's say it was a stop sign, stop at the stop, whatever the command was. He was out of the car, but he was looking in front of the car. Think about that for a minute. His job, if you have remote control, is not to drive the car, so you cannot look in front of the car. You cannot be communicating about the pothole in front of you. You cannot communicate the stop sign. You cannot communicate about the kid in the road or the dog. That ship has sailed. In other words, the planning you did prior to that, this event is going to happen. And if we live in that world right now, try to prevent that little anomaly, or what we're gonna, what we're gonna do? We are not gonna plan for the next turn. So when we live constantly in reaction, trying to drive the car from remote control, because Sean said get out of the car, it's gonna crash. So here's the trick. It was gonna crash anyways. Okay, no, no, you're gonna make the wrong turn or hit something at some point. Everybody, when you make the transition, is going to hit the dog or crash the car. And what, when it happens, because of the communication gap, because we aren't trained to forward think and plan everything out. If Anna or Sam were running, running the fence business, we planned out for like nine months, everything we planned out, right? Backup plan, five plans. We don't think about that, right? So we aren't doing that. So we don't have the plan, so we crash. This is what's gonna happen. Okay, car's about to crash, homeowner's about to get pissed off, job's not gonna get done on time, whatever, guy didn't show up, truck broke down, whatever happened in the fence world that's the anomaly, you are going to leave Aruba immediately. Fly across the country and you're gonna get Mike and say move over and you're gonna get in that car. And you're gonna drive that truck over the median, turn it back around, you're gonna make that turn at I-95 that you were supposed to take because that was the plan and you're gonna make it happen at whatever expense. Shit flying out the back. His poor Mike is like, oh, what did I do wrong? You just ruined his, this whole positive thinking is trash because you just told him he screwed up. 
Reality is your job, right? Turn the thing around. And then you get back on I-95. You're like, there, I got it. At all kinds of pawns are sacrificed and everything's happened, but shit's fun. You, you got back on I-95. Then you get back out of the car. And you're like Sean says, get out of the car. Here you go, Michael. Try it again. And get the remote. Go back to Aruba. Turn or stop, 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 whatever your command is, and you have the same damn thing happen again. Do what? Right now? You're like, oh my God, listen, when I tell you to do something, do it right now. It's not going to happen, guys. If you would just stop and think forward ahead. Here's what you have to do. You have to be okay with the crash. So stop planning on the prevention of this one event. Let's say Mrs. Homeowner's deadline, whatever it is, and you want to make sure you meet it. You're not going to meet it. Okay? You're not. Let it go. Let it happen. Fix it, deal with it, grow from it, move on from it. But you need to be thinking about those next two things down there and give those commands right now. Hey, Michael, in about 25 minutes, you're going to turn right and then you're going to go straight ahead. He's got to know the plan down there. When you live and react here, the only thing you're doing is surefire and moving the next problem here. And then you're going to do the next problem here. You're stepping one problem in front of the next problem, in front of the next problem, in front of the next problem. And this process will repeat for life until you quit or you figure out that you have to be okay with that first crash. Every, it's the price to pay. I be, honestly believe for you to move from being in the driver's seat, owner operator, to an entrepreneur, you have to be okay with the crash. I don't know what the crash is gonna be in your world. I don't know. It might be lose the biggest contract you ever had the opportunity to. I don't know what happens. Something's gonna happen. But if you take your focus off whatever that is and focus down there, if you do it right, you will now prevent the next one, next one, next one, next one. Now you're, you're, you're sailing. Now you're planning, okay? Now you're not reacting to a disaster and putting out a fire. You're encouraging your team members. You know what? Maybe we're gonna give Michael some training on driving. So he can have uh, better communication, get some microphones at work. Maybe it was, he couldn't understand you. Like look at the problem that we have rather than just being stubborn about it, which we all can be very stubborn about the problem. Right? We think we're communicating to him. Perception is, he's like, I couldn't understand what you were saying, can it? That's what happens, that's business. You guys get the analogy, you get the visualization of what I'm trying to say. You gotta be okay with the crash, and you gotta be okay with it's your fault. It's your fault. If he missed the turn, the it's your fault. what's that? Did the crashes ever stop? Yes. They get further between, sorry. Guys. Yes, so that's exactly right. So think about that. My whole point of this, guys, is the crash is gonna happen, and if you do this right, you're gonna get the bump here, you're gonna get the knot on the head here, okay? And we're gonna push that next crash a lot further down the road, and then the goal is you're gonna get that one, but don't get stuck. If it happens again, don't get stuck down in the business worrying about the straps weren't right on the back of the truck. You know, and so you leave your office, you run out, my God, I've done this so many times, and get all mad, put them like this, you guys, and put them like, God dang it, stop. I mean, I've done this so many times, I gotta realize, that's not the best place for me to be. However, Nugget, we need training on straps. Yeah. Right? There's a time and place for that. Right now, under fire is not the time and place for that. I'm super guilty of this, guys. Absolutely super guilty of freaking out on my team members because something's not right and it's the biggest problem in the world right now. Uh, yeah. Okay, we got to stop doing that. We have got to stop doing that. There is nothing productive going to come out of that. You just destroyed that guy's positive thinking for the day. You flipped it completely when you're yelling and screaming about pointing out a mistake. If it's a huge safety measure, and it's going to be a huge, address it, but please don't be screaming, hollering, and say, hey, hey, I think you might have forgot the strap on this. Let's get that restrap, and you're good to go. Boom. Not, not the Sean King. What in the hell is going on, guys? I told you 15 times. Oh, my God, I got to do this myself. That didn't, that's not good. That is not good. No good can come from that. But it's our responsibility as owners, as leaders, everything we say and do, they're watching. Our body language, they're watching. What you do, and then you tell them to do something different, they're watching. All right, they're paying attention, really close attention to everything. So you're in a microscope, you're a fish in a bowl. They're watching you, okay? Time and a place. So the crash is gonna happen. How you react to the crash is going to dictate where you go next. Reaction, okay? How you freak out about it, whatever it is. Mrs. Jones' fence is installed upside down, okay? 
we'll have to install it right side up. No problem. Put, plan for it, put it in the budget, put it in the schedule. We're going to redo her fence. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's okay. It's not the end of the world. But we've got to learn to be okay with that. Most guys are not. Most guys in this room, myself included, are not okay with not being perfect or the best. And in order to grow, that's another key thing, craftsmen and fence ninjas want to be the absolute best. They build fences like freaking pianos and carpentry. We, can't not, we cannot do that and multiply that by t 10 times. So we build great quality. Great, great is, a, I love the word great, but I don't want number one. I don't need over the top exaggerated because no one in this world is paying for that. Our customers aren't paying for the services half of us give. If you went and built a fence yourself, if I went and built a fence by myself and I wanted to do the best job I could, there's no homeowners gonna pay for that. That's ridiculous, right? It's over the top. No one even knows that it can be done but us, right? So we follow a standard that really shouldn't be. Good quality, I'm, I'm absolute, I'm, guys, I'm telling you, good quality, great fence that serves the needs for our customers, short of super craftsman carpentry freaking pianos out there. Does that make sense? But you gotta be okay with that because you're not building it. You're not building it. You want, you want to increase quality by tools, effect, methods, and procedures and training. You want your team to be better than you, all right? But you also don't have the time for them to be out there routering the ends of the dog ear pickets. Would that be better? Sure. Would you want to mill every picket and, and yeah, they're a super fence, but no one's going to pay for that, All right? That type of thing happens. Kevin Poole, love him to death. You guys know who Kevin Poole is? Uh, social media. Great guy. Love Kevin Poole. Absolute owner-operator. He wants to move on from that. Kevin Poole's problem, look at his fences he builds. He's dadoing the top of the 4 by 4s He's Craig jigging the 2 by 4s of the rails. All right? Is that bad? Is it bad? Hell no, that's a damn good fence. Is he getting paid for it? No. I can tell you right now, 100% no. I absolutely know he's not getting paid for that. He's getting paid the same amount of money that Tom, Dick, and Harry's building a fence across the street. Is his fence better? Yes. Is he an owner, operator, firefighter? Yeah. Does he want to grow his company? He's going to have to stop that. Something in your world, you got to do, figure it out in your world. Whatever the, you got to be okay with great. It doesn't have to be number one. So it's going to be a process. Right, we agree? Is it, you, you were introduced to this last year, and it didn't happen overnight. It's not gonna happen overnight. You probably heard this story, but did you hear me talk about the driver's seat before? No? Driver's seat, no? New to you? Get out of the driver's seat? I learned that lesson, guys. So I learned that lesson, guys. It was forced upon me when I went to law enforcement. When I had to go into law enforcement was to get health insurance because my wife had breast cancer and Colin had brain surgery. We had to have health insurance and my business had it, but my premium went to $4,000 a month once we had the first uh, cancer treatment. It's unfair, it's not fair, because I can't afford $4,000 a month. I was only doing a million dollars revenue as an owner operator at that time in my world. So uh, in 2009, I had to find a job that would get health insurance and a job that would keep Sean King busy. Right? That's why I was a cop. So as I become a cop, when I went from an interview to become a cop, the sheriff, who knew who I was, obviously, in Mr. Fence, I'm in my interview, the boardroom, all these brass and intimidating guys and corporals and lieutenants and all these dudes in there. And the sheriff asked me, looked across the table and said, how are you going to handle being told what to do every day as an owner of a business telling everybody else what to do. And my response was immediate, immediate. There was no hesitation. I'm like, I can't wait for somebody to tell me what to do every day. I'm gonna be the best employee you've ever had. <laughs> he loved the response and I got hired. But when I got hired, I did not know how much it was gonna change my business. Some people are like, well, how's your business gonna survive? Well, I had to take care of my family first, okay? Take care of yourself first, family first. So I didn't know, but I had to get out of the driver's seat. I was in the academy for 18 weeks, three hours away from my business, in a boot camp, marching down hallways and shit for 18 weeks, getting woke up at four o'clock in the morning, 
tossing our beds, going outside and running. I'm like, I'm 32 years old and, these kids, and I'm getting beat on and roughed up and run outside and start cold. Got to make your bed, press it perfect. You think I'm, you think I'm focusing on the business? You think that business as all has anything to do? But no, there was no phone calls to the business. There was nothing to the business. I put a plan in place. I put a plan in place and I could check it on the weekends. And the business went from here, profit wise doubled, revenue increased by 25%. Holy shit, how did that happen? I got out of the way. I was the problem. You know how that, that I'm like, wow, dude, damn, is that not the proof? So then I just, when I came back, I, I'd be careful. Like, I got involved, but understanding that planning is everything and you gotta get the hell out of the driver's seat. I'd be forced out. 